Hello and welcome to another PCALC stream. Uh, today we're going to be continuing with our, our bug hunting. So um, last time we left off, I believe um, the thing we needed to fix was MMAP. So yeah, we've got to fix me there. So let's just do a quick search to refresh ourselves on what all needs to be done. And uh, check the to do's. All right, so yeah, we're just going to be focusing on MMAP right now. Uh, we noticed last time when we were debugging that MMAP would return a uh, an invalid address, a, a garbage address. It wasn't null, but uh, it wasn't a good address either. So um, pretty sure something about our MMAP implementation is broken. So first thing I want to do is review the inline assembly syntax stuff again. So here, let me switch this to the pcalc workspace. And I don't know if we have links.risky.tv open on this one. Okay, and what was this? Oh, this was the, the linker document we were looking at. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to look at this anymore, at least not right now. Nah, we don't need unit tests. We like to live dangerously. We like to break things and, and spend hours fixing them. <laughs> I might add a unit test at some point, in all seriousness, but uh, not right now. Uh, let me see. So I'm going to go to things.risky.tv. And uh, we want to know about inline assembly. Okay, now I think I want to know about explicit register variables. Right, so with the that's what we're doing here. These are our global uh, register variables. Uh, if I'm if I'm understanding the the naming convention right, that these are the ones that are, um, or no, they're saying this is outside of a a function now, aren't they? Which makes sense about them calling it global. Yeah, outside of a function. I was thinking they were saying, like, um, having a, a variable, like, um, they're, you know, they're giving this, like, they're setting a register equal to, to a value, whereas uh, otherwise, I, uh, the other thing I was thinking of is when you're like using registers within an, uh, an assembly block that's actually like doing code. But uh, this is something different yet.
That's interesting. So I guess in C, if you wanted to, uh, using uh, inline assembly, um, you could just declare all your registers as globals like this and then manage them yourself rather than having the compiler do it. That's interesting. Not necessarily the most useful thing, but an interesting idea nonetheless. So yeah, we're declaring local register variables associated with a specific register. The register keyword is required. The register name must be valid for the target. Oh, really? Well, it's not too hard. We're just doing very, very basic stuff. So um, what I'm doing here, um, I assume you understand that the you know the way the machine works is there are registers and there's memory and the like the CPU is operating on the registers right and if you look at assembly code um, I can show you some so if I go to source uh, nvim Start.s. Okay, so uh, first of all, let me just um, like ignore the stuff I'm commenting out and just focus on this stuff. So uh, these, those are instructions, as are these. And then here you just have a label, right? And in assembly, there's two different syntaxes, which makes it confusing. Um, one syntax, oh, okay, I see. So for inline assembly, uh, it's a really, really ugly syntax, which is why I wrote this using um, uh, like just an assembly file instead of doing it in in line. Uh, just I the only reason it's a separate file is because it looks so much nicer <laughs> than doing inline assembly. So with inline assembly, uh, what ha what you have is you have this ASM statement. So here we're saying ASM volatile because it's going to do stuff. And uh, here's our assembly code. So we're just doing a syscall. So the instruction is just syscall. But then um, we're passing things in through registers and expecting things to come out through registers. So what happens is the syntax basically, uh, it's like this. So you have like an ASM and that's, you know, that's just this. And then you have parentheses. Um, and so this is an ASM statement. And then in here, what you do is you have a string which holds the code. And then you have a colon. And you put uh, output parameters here, basically. Uh, and then here, you put your input. And then here, you put what you clobber so um to give uh the example of what we're doing here is the code we're doing 
is a syscall instruction. The output we're doing is the A register um, is being set. And they have these, this is where the syntax gets really ugly and arcane. Uh, the equals, uh, I don't remember off the top of my head what's the, what that's telling it. I'd have to look it up. But um, we're saying uh, that's going to be the, the ret value. Um, so when we are saying return ret here, uh, it should be returning the value that came out of the syscall. And then um, for input, we have... Uh, and again, this is where it gets really arcane. So I, this is the stuff I need to look up to remember what it does. There's the D, and that's saying that basically what I understand is this is passing into um, the address into the register that, um, uh, like the first argument register. And then um, the next one is S. So we're passing the length variable into that register. Uh, and like that's actually, when, when I say it's passing it in, I mean like it's doing a move instruction to put that in that register if it's not already there. So we're setting up what the values in each register are. And then, uh, you know, it goes on like this. And so when you do the syscall instruction, that expects the arguments to be in specific registers, right? So what we're doing is we're setting up those values to be in the right registers and doing the syscall instruction. And then what you clobber, this tells the compiler that uh, it has to assume that you modified these values. So if you look at the ABI for um, x86, 64, um, a syscall can clobber RCX register, R11 register, and memory. Uh, so I'm just saying that all of those are clobbered. Uh, and the point of that is just to prevent optimizations from assuming things that are wrong because you messed with memory and it didn't realize, basically. Um, and so you're not always going to be affecting memory so I could probably take that out for some of them, like, um, oh, I don't know. Uh, connect might not clobber memory. I don't know, but I just put it, I just put RCX R11 in memory for all of them. That's what the C library does anyway. Uh, the C standard library is they, you know, they wrap syscall, like a function called syscall that, um, We'll just like do this, so yeah. Yeah, memory just means uh, it's going to affect memory. I, I don't know if it's necessarily saying that it'll write to memory, uh, like just even just reading memory i think can have side effects i don't know if that's true on x86 64 because i don't know the details of x86 64 because i've never really studied it but uh i feel like you could get side effects even from a read like uh if you read and um something goes wrong it might cause a trap or uh, you know, set some status variable. Um, so I wouldn't say necessarily just writing to memory, but it's, it's, you're doing something with memory. But in general, yes. Things like writing to memory. So anyway, uh, we are going to be re getting a refresher on this stuff right now too, so we'll see what the, the docs actually say about it.
Okay, so uh, the point of of having code like this, where we have these register variables, is it's saying the only point of this, the only supported use of this feature, is to specify registers for input and output operands when calling a extended assembly, which is what we're doing. We're using these as operands for the syscall. So, um, Defining a register variable does not reserve the register. Okay, so it only matters when you're using the extended assembly. Um, otherwise, the contents of the register are not guaranteed. So now, I guess the next question is, are we sure we're doing extended assembly versus basic assembly. What's the difference there? Because if we're passing parameters to or from basic assembly, that would not be supported. So that could be a bug source. We are using input and output operands, so that should be fine. We're using the standard calling conventions. I mean, the kernel calling conventions, but I think that should be fine. OK. Now, oh, OK, so extended assembly refers to that syntax of having the operand specified like we're doing. So see, this is what I was showing you about the, the ASM keyword and um, how they have the colon and then the output operands and then another colon input. And then another one for clobbers. So yeah, we're using volatile to disable certain optimizations because our you know we're doing a syscall that's gonna have side effects. No. Um, unless the syscall itself uh, will set Erno, but we're not supporting Erno in our program. We're not doing anything to get that value or whatever. So we could, you know, set that up to, to do that, but. Um, the other thing, though, is. Um, I don't think in the case that we're having here, we would get um, a value in Erno anyway, because um, if you do man to syscall, uh, the return value, return, uh, So I guess it depends on the syscall, but it should be a negative one return value to indicate an error. So, you know, if I say mmap return, uh, I'm pretty sure it should be returning a negative one as the address. Um, 
Let me just double check that. Uh, yeah, on an error, the value map failed, which is negative one in the pointer. Uh, and that's not the value we're getting. So that tells us that it's a mistake in how, and it's a mistake in our assembly code, basically. Uh, I assume the mmap call, the syscall is working just fine. And um, our assembly is just broken. Um, so I'm, I wouldn't expect anything to even be in Erno because we're not even getting the negative one return value. So, okay. So the volatile is good. We're not doing a jump, so we don't care about go to. Okay, now if I jump to output on brands, okay, here are the constraints. So the equals means uh, a variable a variable overwriting an existing value. So that's what the equals mean. A equals means in equals a or return. We're saying it's overwriting the value in A, which is correct because, you know, we're passing the first thing we're passing in to the syscall is goes in the A register. So we're overwriting writing the syscall number with the return value. Uh, so that looks good. Uh, thank you for the link, Tiberion. I will take a look. Oh, but this is for checking Erno without libc. Uh, I'm not concerned about doing that right now. If we really want to check Erno without libc, uh, we can implement that. But um, right now, I'm not concerned about that. Like if we get to a point that we have a working syscall that's returning an error code, uh, then it would maybe be reasonable to look into setting up Erno to work without libc if we actually can't figure it out what's going wrong without using it. Oh, you say the part I want to read is lower on the page? Let me... Oh, really? Really? That's interesting. Where was that? So maybe we are getting a valid error. Hmm. 
Well, n no, this is talking about uh, a map wrapper. Uh, we're using the syscall directly. So um, their syscall is a macro to syscall red, which is defined right here. Uh, and that is saying uh, if the value is greater than whatever, it sets Erno and returns negative one. Otherwise, it returns R. Although, so then what is what is the value in R then that the actual syscall set? Because if this if this code is what's setting negative one, then what is the syscall returning? So, okay, so the syscall is actually returning an error number, and this wrapper is doing the conversion from, from the error code to, and the value is error no, it's negative error no, is what the, the return value from the actual syscall is. Okay. That's interesting. So if we took the value, I don't know if I still have it in a terminal, but we could rerun it and see what it gives us. If we take whatever value it is and then negate it, uh, that should give us what the Erno is. And then we can just look that up in the table. So uh, let me let me see here. Let's do that here. So what all were we doing here? Okay, so we're going to run this through GDB. We're going to break on, uh, just break on MMAP. Run. Step, step, step. 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 Okay, so there's the value we're getting. So now I do that. Let's do... 
Okay, so if that's working correctly, it, the value is 22 for Erno. So then... Um, what are the possible return values for the, the possible air nodes? And this doesn't give us the numbers, so let's... So now we need to find where the Erno file is. Let's just search for a random error. Okay. Should be under architecture bits. So our um x eighty six sixty four bits. Uh, no, there's not one there. Let's take a look at the generic one. Okay, 22. E in val. Okay, so if we got an E in val, it means we don't like address length or offset. So something I'm passing in is bad then. It could also be that length was zero. It could also be that flags contained neither map private or map shared, or contained both of them. So uh, that tells us some useful information. It could be a variety of things, but now we know some of the things that could have gone wrong. So let me see. Uh, let's take a look at the arguments we passed it first of all. So length should not be zero. Uh, it looks like it is 4096. Uh, let's just confirm that. 4096. Uh, what else? We don't like address, length, or offset. Um, Address is just null, so that should be fine. Offset should be um, zero, is what we have there. So I think those should be good. Uh, let's see. It could be that the flags do not contain either map private or map shared, or contain both those values. Uh, my flags are set to 32. So let me see what the flags are. So we're looking for map private and map shared. And uh, Okay, so I'm actually passing that in at the call site. So let's go to platform. So I'm passing map anonymous, but I am not passing either map private or map shared. So there's our problem right there. We need either map private or map shared. So map shared, um, visible to other processes mapping the same region. We don't want that. We want map private, copy on right mapping. So we want to do map private. Now let's go back here.
You know where that's defined. And uh, I am going to still go back to studying the, the inline assembly stuff, even though we don't need it anymore, just because I don't remember what the, the syntax stuff was. And I think it'll be helpful for me to have a refresher. So I'm going to go back to, to doing that, even though we don't need it uh, after I fix this. So, um, OK, map private is 0x02. And let's go to the code where I have mine defined, which must be in here, I'm guessing. Yeah. So thank you so much for the link, Tiberion. Uh, it would have taken me quite a while to figure that out without that. So that was greatly appreciated. Yeah, we don't need to do that. <laughs> Uh, I don't. I don't currently have a cert defined. I know that's really easy to do in a cert macro, but uh, I'm not using a certs. And uh, we can just check it in a debugger. And if it's bad, it's uh, something to fix. So let's let's build it. Looks like it built fine. Uh, we have seven. Warnings, so let's maybe review our warnings quick just to make sure So the new ones are basically just that when I'm doing an s break I'm not changing the sign explicitly I'm just gonna ignore that for now so let's check it out in a debugger. OK, so we sig faulted in a, uh, a printf from the SDB S printf in create window on line 250 from main.c6. So let's take a look at uh, DLT create window line 250. OK, interesting. So the PLT alloc works now, but not quite in that um, something we've got here is bad. So I'm just concatenating X11 display onto sock base. Wait a minute. See, that's the problem right there. I'm just calling it wrong. I didn't pass it a buffer. I, I started with the format. So that was just a stupid error. Uh, where am I intending to put this? Let me see. Oh, X11 IPC header. 
obviously, since I allocated it right before. So yeah, that should be good. All right, making progress. Now, uh, it's telling us we got a malformed X11 response, but that success value doesn't look right. Uh, and I think, you know, that, that looks a lot like a format specifier. Oh, did I not reserve space for the, you might be right about that. You are correct. Thank you for pointing that out, Tiberian. You have a very good eye to catch that on stream. Uh, but I don't think that was the problem of the malformed X11 response. LT right. Is that not what I'm using? Debug is what I'm using. So I wonder, it must be, um, SDB sprintf must use different formatter format specifiers than HHU. So they use H L L J Z T I sixty four I thirty two I. Okay. Um. Oh, whoops. So I was expecting HH to be 8 bits. So this is saying H non L L L J Z T H L L J Z T I 64 I 32 I. So they don't support L and they don't support HH, but then how do you do those? Do you just cast it up? Let's just uh, see what happens if we just say percent HU. But yeah, success is not equal to zero because we got a fatal. So that's interesting.
All right, uh, see you later, Kraifa. So this gave me a big value. Um, hmm. Yeah, I'm just a little doubtful of that because it was 8-bit, so uh, I think the high bits ended up being filled with garbage. But what if we cast it? Hmm. Seems like uh, we're pulling in garbage. Those values are different, so yeah. I think we're just reading the wrong part of memory when we're parsing it. Okay, so before I continue, I'm going to review this stuff, and then we'll go back to looking at that. Uh, we're not using any constraints on the inputs. So that's not what I'm looking for. One thing I'm wondering about is I've seen in inline assembly when they refer to a label that they put a B on the end and I was wondering if that was specified in here but maybe not.
Oh, here's the documentation on built-in unreachable. I use that. But yeah, this is a different syntax than what I'm thinking of. Okay, so the rest of the documentation I need must be in the GNU Assembler documentation. Well, I mean, no, it it has to be inline assembler documentation. What I'm thinking of, because I'm thinking of the, like this stuff, that should definitely be inline assembler documentation. So I guess I just wasn't looking hard enough. So I'm using ASM symbolic name. Or no, because I'm not putting it in square brackets. So these are actually constraints. So 
So I'm looking for machine constraints is what I'm looking for. Uh, Let me just search constraints. Constraints for particular machines. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. And then we need to find the right family. So probably IA64, unless they have like x86-64. There's risk five. Oh, x86 family. Okay, so A is of course the A register, capital D, the DI register, capital S, that's going to be the SI register, yep, uh, lowercase d is the D register. So that would be like uh, RDX, whereas this is RDI, right? That makes sense. And then R lowercase R lowercase isn't a it's the um you sure that's just register in general yeah these are all hinting registers but there are R10 R8 and R9 we set those up here so that's telling us that uh, the x86 family doesn't have specifiers for R10, R8, or R9, which is why we used these. So let's just scroll through and confirm that. I'm looking like that's the case. So yeah, that makes sense. And then, of course, we're collaborating RCX R11 memory. Okay, so yeah, I think we're at a point where we understand everything again. This is RAX. This is RAX. Uh, this is RDI. 
RSI, RDX, R10, R8, and R9 as specified up here. And we clobber RCX, R11, and memory. The equals A is telling us that we're overwriting an input value. And it had a warning in there about how um, you need to have it overwrite, overwrite an output if you're going to, to um, modify an input. Like it's you're not supposed to modify inputs. And if you do, like if you do and you're not using it as an output, they suggested putting it as like a dummy output parameter so that it doesn't like make the compiler go crazy. But then if you're not using this output parameter, uh, you, you need to mark it volatile. Otherwise the compiler could optimize it away because you're not using it. And uh, then we just return the value, which of course is the, the output from the syscall. And then the other thing is, this is using the, the kernel calling convention. And I don't have that linked on here because it's an x86-64 thing. We have the calling convention uh, linked, of course, for RISC-V, but you're not doing RISC-V programming right now. So um, x86 calling convention. This isn't the actual ABI document, but this probably specifies the kernel one. Maybe not. Let's just look up the ABI. So it looks like, okay, yeah, here we have an ABI document. So this will tell you all the details about normal parameter passing. And I think kernel is going to be documented somewhere else. They might stick it in the same place though. Kernel support, Linux conventions. Yeah, calling conventions for Linux. Same calling conventions as user level applications, except there should be an except in there. Okay, is the same as for the user level with the following differences. Uh, user applications used as integer registries for passing the sequence RDI, RSI, RDX, RCX, R8, and R9. The kernel uses RDI, RSI, RDX, and this is where it gets different. It uses R10 and then R8 and then R9. And so that's why you see we do R10, R8, R9, because we're following the kernel conventions for a syscall. Uh, we use the syscall instruction. Oh, whoops, I just... Okay, let me get back to where I was. Just a moment. I just had an accidental click there that... <laughs> uh, threw me off, but yeah, so we're using the syscall instruction and the kernel destroys RCX and R11. So we specify that, that those are getting clobbered. 
And then, of course, we're also specifying memory because uh, syscalls can have, you know, memory side effects. This one in particular is mapping uh, memory. And the number of the syscall, it says, is passed in RAX, which is what we're doing. You can see that right, uh, right there. Syscall number nine for MMAP. Uh, what else? Limited to six arguments. Uh, no arguments are passed directly on the stack. Returning from the syscall, register RAX contains the result of the system call. And you can see that's what we're doing right here. And uh, it says that a value in the range between negative 4095 and negative 1 indicates an error. It is negative error now. So right there in the ABI, that specifies what uh, we found out from the, the link uh, Tiberian gave us. Uh, but this is where it's actually defined in the standard. And only values of class integer or class memory are passed to the kernel, which is referencing uh, stuff that's defined elsewhere in this document. But just in case you're curious, uh, it is it might be what they are saying data representation here. Maybe not. But they define this for the calling conventions, the different types of parameters. Here we go. So integer, this class consists of integral types, except pointer types, that fit into one of the general purpose registers. And um, memory was the other one. This class consists of types that will be passed and returned in memory via the stack. So that's everything there that we care about. Uh, and with that refresher, I'm going to call this fix me done. We have a seemingly working mem map. We didn't bother to assert that it's returning the proper size that we requested, um, like Croefa suggested. But uh, we think it's working currently. And the current confusion. Well, actually, I think we know it's working because um, because this printf works. It's very likely that it's working. <laughs> um, but okay, so we're doing. The thing that, that went wrong for us was that um, we we got a malformed dex11 response, which suggests to me that we parsed it incorrectly. I'm pretty sure we're getting a valid x11 response, probably a success response. And uh, it looks malformed to us because we um, we failed to read it properly. So let's review what we're doing. We're connecting to the socket. Uh, we create a connection request. 
uh, we write it to the um, uh, to the server through the through the socket, and then we read the response from the socket, and uh, yeah, that's not working. So first of all. First thing we can do is we are explicitly zero, zeroing out this memory. Let's uh, go ahead and put in the values that we're using right here. We don't need that. And then um, So the next question I have is let's take a look at the header structure. All right, that's the request, the reply type. So it's success, reason length, major, minor, and length. Now, let me close a bunch of this stuff. I'll keep that one open for now. I'll keep this open. This can all go. This stuff can go. All right. Okay, connection set up. Oh yeah, so the response is actually a union of three different types, but we're not doing a union because we're lazy and we don't really need to um, because it just so happens that the structure of this one and this one match pretty closely. And if we get this one, we're just planning on crashing the application anyway, so we don't care. <laughs> so. But yeah, I'm expecting one byte success, one byte unused, two bytes major, two bytes minor, uh, two bytes length of additional data, one byte success, one byte uh, length for the, the reason. Uh, Two bytes major, two bytes minor, two bytes length. So yeah, that matches. So we must be reading it wrong. Um, we're reading So it takes the file descriptor, the buffer, and the count. We're passing it um, the socket or the file descriptor. When connection header for the buffer and the size of a connection reply type, which is the proper type. So the size of that in bytes, let's double check that it takes the count in bytes. I'm quite sure it does, but
Yeah, count bytes. So is it a, a precedence issue? I'm thinking this will take the the win pointer, dereference it, uh, and then take the header uh, member from the connection, and then take the address of it. So it's writing into the header is what I'm expecting that to do. I mean, I'll try parentheses, but... I think that should be right as as it is. But clearly it is not. So when is a pointer to one of these structures, which has an X11 connection T, which has a reply, is the header. Interesting. I mean, I'm definitely doing something stupid. I'm just not sure what that is I'm doing. <laughs> That's stupid. So let's run this through the debugger and try to see what's going on. So I think I'm going to tell it to to break on plt create window. Here, let's do a rebuild. Run it. Or rather than running it, I should set the breakpoint. Window, run. Now we're going to step through all this stuff.
Oh, we're in the the mem copy right now. That looks good to me. And our X11 screen is set to zero. Getting our memory. Okay, we're concatenating them. Okay, I stepped a little bit farther than I intended there, but uh, I'm going to check the X11 IPC adder. Oh. Okay, that's actually not correct. So that explains part of it. So this is wrong. Oh, I see what we did. <laughs> we concatenated it onto itself rather than. So that's an easy fix. Although, interesting, interestingly, the printf. The sprintf was doing sock base and x11 display. So, when did my x11 display get messed up? That is question number one. Did my PLT, it kind of looks like my PLT alloc gave me the same memory twice. Maybe. Hmm.
because if this returned the previous address I allocated... Well, but wait, this isn't allocated on here, unless it is from a different path. So yeah, it takes this path because it gets it. So we did a PLT alloc, which gave us the memory that we put the the value in. And I'm thinking what happened is when we did our second PLT alloc, instead of giving us the next available spot in memory, it gave us the same address. So this became an alias to x11 display. But then this would be saying we're writing into both x11 display and x11 IPC adder address. And we're saying this, we're passing in the same thing. It should just be the string holding zero. This should be sock base. So if that were the case, what I would expect to happen would be it would have the right value. Like the end result would be the same, but it would override X11 display. Like that would get overridden. That's what I would expect if that were the case. And that's not quite the behavior we see. But there's definitely a bug here, at least one bug. How do you do like watching a variable in GDP? Watch points. That's what I want. Okay, so I just say watch expression. Okay, and I want to watch X11 display. So we're just going to step here until we hit that watch point. Is there a way to say continue until a watch point is hit?
I'll just keep stepping it. So we should hit it pretty soon. Like here we're allocating the memory for it. And that should trip it once that's done. So let's pay attention to what this allocates for us. Oh, that was the round up to alignment. Okay, so that worked. We allocated uh, 16 bytes because that's what we set the alignment to. So the 7F72, F272, E000 is the address for what um, we're setting it to, the variable that we're watching. So we see x11 display is currently an empty empty string and it's at the address we allocated which is what we expect Now we're mem copying and then we set the null terminator so if I print it right now, it won't have the null terminator on it. But it'll probably handle it. Yeah, so it's fine with that. Unless uh, I'm offline, it might have already had the, like this line might have already executed. But yeah, this all looks good. But I mean, our watch point, I didn't see like a thing of the watch point triggering. Please watch that. I'm just going to print it myself again because I'm a little paranoid of this, but uh, it's still good. So now let's pay attention to what this allo allocates.
Okay, so now we want to print result and we want to print region current. So that's really interesting because this is the value from the previous. So it is giving us back the same memory. But why? I'll need to step through this one more time. But let's keep going for now. Or here we're setting region current. But the, the return is wrong. So there you can see it did a good allocation again, but it doesn't matter if it did a good allocation if it reset <laughs> between here and there. Because, see, that's the same memory we got last time. So that might be a bug in my library. So yeah, so I don't know why our watch points don't work. That's annoying, but we saw what happened. Now we just need to comb through it one more time to figure out why it happened. So, so here are our current values for our newly initialized uh, region here. To begin, it's set to 7F62E32D000. 
the end is set to 7F621E32E000. And the current is set to begin. The alignment is set to 16. The flags are set to zero. Okay. Now, uh, we aren't growing down. We are growing up in memory. So we're starting at this address and then, you know, we're growing towards, towards the end here. And we see that with current set as it is, uh, it's pointing at the beginning. So we haven't, uh, we haven't allocated anything yet is what that means. The region is, is empty right now. Now, let's step through until we hit our first allocation. So here we just hit the the variable we're looking for, but we haven't allocated anything. So uh, when I get the chance, I'll check to make sure the context is the same as before, which it is. So that looks good. Let's keep stepping. So there should be an allocation coming up. Yeah, right, right here. So right now we see the region is completely empty and we're gonna step into our allocation. So here we're actually calling NWR region alloc. And let's look at this carefully here. So our alignment is currently uh, 16. So that greater than one is gonna be true. So it's gonna do a uh, roundup to alignment of N. We see N is equal to two because we're allocating space for the zero character and then the actual zero that uh, terminates the C style string. So we're going to step into NWR roundup to alignment and uh, so we see we're rounding our the amount we're allocating. We requested two bytes and our alignment is 16. So we're allocating 16 bytes. That what, that's what this is doing, is it rounded up to the alignment. And then we step. And uh, so now we just set rounded. So if I print rounded, or we're not done with that yet, never mind. Now we set rounded. So that should be 16, which it is. So now we're checking if the region grows down. It does not grow down. So we should enter this uh, if statement. So we went from line 508 to 510. That looks correct. Um, 
So yeah, that went uh, into, it stepped in to this line right here because the region does not grow down. So result is a newly defined variable, so it's just zero. Um, but region current is the beginning because we haven't allocated anything yet, so that looks good. So far is so good, everything's correct. So we're gonna step. Let's just print the region. Oh, it just gives us the address if we do that. But we see region current is uh, what we expect. It's equal to region begin. And uh, so we just set the result. So that looks good. Let's step. Uh, region current is less than or equal to region n. And verify that. And we also bumped up region current on this line here. So uh, region current is currently set to uh, 16 bytes have been allocated. That's what this one is indicating here in the address. That's a 16 byte jump. So that looks good, but at some point region current is getting set back to region begin. That's what I'm trying to find. So the current line we're on is if region current is less than or equal to region end, which it is, the step or returning result. Let's verify this in the code, line 513. Yeah, so this is saying just return result. So yeah, that should break us out of the region alloc. And then we're back in PLT alloc, so let's that must be in common. So now we're on the if not result line. We did get a result, or we should have. So yeah, we see it gave us the correct result. And if we print the context, uh, current looks good, right? This is correct. So right now, everything looks good. Where does it go bad? Uh, let's continue stepping. We return results because we don't fatal. We have a good result, so we return it. Looks good. Step. Okay, now we're doing a mem copy. X11 display D and X11 display length. We're copying the character into the uh, memory we just allocated. So if I print D, you see it's the zero character. If I print uh, X11 display length, you see it's one character. And if I print X11 display, you see it's the memory we allocated and it's an empty string. Okay, and we'll print the context. Uh, the 
Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Right here. Current got reset. So that gives us a hint of when it's happening. So current was good. On line 110 of platform common. We returned from it on line 112. And we stepped into line 216. And the value is bad. Two sixteen, that's higher up. So this is happening up here. Are we passing context? Aha, uh -huh. we're passing the context by value rather than by pointer. And the region uh, is not a pointer inside the structure. It's actually in the context structure. So the problem is that uh, when we pass this by value, we're copying the values. So it's not writing it back out to the actual, this needs to be a pointer is the, the problem there. So let's just do that everywhere we pass a context around. I was originally thinking passing it by value just because right now the only thing that's in the context is the region. And I, did, I didn't think about the fact that the region itself needs to, you know, preserve its values. I was thinking of it as if the context were just holding a pointer to a region. So it wouldn't matter, you know, like unless you were changing up what the, you know, what region it was pointing to, which you would never do. So yeah, it's better to just pass the context by pointer always. So that needs to take it that needs to take it what else uh platform 
X11, platform XCB, main. But I think I took care of everything in platform common. Let's do main. So this looks good. Now this we're going to pass by uh, the address test as a pointer. Same thing here. Okay, I think we're good. Let's go to platform XCB and do that one. Yeah, we're good again. If the compiler agrees, it does. All right, well, we get a different error now. No protocol specified. Interesting. Now, I think that's actually coming from the from X11. Uh, I don't think I have an, a protocol error message here let me do that in the source directory yeah i don't so that's actually coming from x11 cool i'm still not printing the success value properly though Need to figure out how to do that. So we got a fatal. I'm pretty sure our fatal happened right here. So success must, must equal zero. It would be nice if I could figure out how to properly print it. Rather than running this in a debugger, Yeah, so success is equal to zero. We need to figure out how to print it. But we get the reason. So it's complaining about uh, no 
new protocol. I'll look into that after I figure out how you print the darn thing. How you print a a U8. So bizarre. So, okay, so these are bits. So, even if it were 8 bit, that wouldn't be a zero. What is going on? Clearly the value of success is zero because this this runs and we get this fatal message. So I want to debug my debug. <laughs> uh, let's let's check it out in GDB. I will break on the first debug. Run. Okay, here we go. So the value is zero. So we step in here. Okay, so that's what a VA list actually looks like under the hood. Oh. The message looks good.
format looks good. So here we're parsing the format. Seems like this is doing the actual work, but I missed the point where it, uh, where it pulled it out of the uh, VA args. So yeah, I didn't really follow that. Oh right, because they do the the macros. 
so you can rename it. Uh, and they're passing the VA list into VS printf cb do the actual work. Okay, so here is where it actually pulled it out. So this is if you're doing a star or a dot, which indicates field width or precision in the format specifiers. So we want to find one that's relevant to us, basically. So what I'm currently doing is B. Let's see if we can find that in here. We can probably find something that's more relevant to us in here than B while we're at it. Okay, here is lower binary. So it looks like uh, it's going to jump to radix num, wherever that is. After setting some stuff up. Which is right here. Here is where we get the number. So it's either going to happen on one of these lines where we pull out the actual the actual number. And it's looking like it's either pulling a uint32 or a uint64. So that might be part of the problem right there where it's trying to pull larger than the width of what we're passing and uh, it's probably not zeroing out high bits. giving us a garbage number. Uh, that's just a theory though. So I want to know if there's a format specifier for 8-bit integers. Uh, as it was looking to me like it wasn't HHU with sprintf because when I tried that it printed HU
Right. So clearly this is not what it supports. Yeah, exactly. We're getting undefined behavior. Because C sucks. So maybe HH is like a C11 thing, which is why this doesn't have it. So that's saying that casting it should work though. I thought I tried that. See, that doesn't work for me. I wonder if the precedence is wrong for the cast. No. Okay, so it did set S to zero.
So it's a U32 being passed into percent U. Why isn't that working? Yeah, an unsigned integer could be present you. I wonder, is it not fitting in the the space I allocated for message? Because I'm just doing a dirty hack here, right? <laughs> this is this is just a, a dirty hack. Okay, where are we in the program right now? So it jumps into right here. Yeah, I think. We're going to bump this up. This is definitely not 2,000 characters, 2048 characters, it, and that shouldn't be the problem. Hmm. I mean, I understand that this is going to get filled with garbage, but as print is, is going to write over that garbage anyway. Wait a minute. I think we're calling as printf wrong here because we're passing a VA list that we did a VA start on into as printf. As printf takes like you actually typing out the argument. So I, th I think that's maybe the problem. We want to pass it, like we want to use VS printf. I 
I mean, I guess we want to just use vs printf cb and this be zero zero. I don't know what all um, this vs printf cb takes in. It takes a clamp callback. Where is that defined? Yeah, it takes a callback pointer and a user pointer. We're not using those. So I'm gonna change this. We use VS printf CB. So I assume there's a normal VS printf, but yeah, it's just a uh, a wrapper for VS printf CB. So it makes sense to just call VS printf CB directly. We pass that as zero, a zero, and then this stuff. And then they were also using a result, weren't they? But that's just an int. We don't care about that. We don't care about the the return value. That's like the number characters formatted or something. I don't know. I don't care. There we go. That was the problem. We have debugged our debug. And I am a happy man. So this should work as it is. get rid of the in here and now it's just a question of why we're getting fatal no protocol specified let's also check out what happens when I don't cast it now that it's properly done okay it, it, it it's cool with that it might be undefined behavior so maybe that's not a good idea to do that, but I'm going to do it anyway because it seems like it's working right now. And I don't care if my debug stuff is implemented poorly because uh, that just means it's going to you know, cause me a headache uh, if I have bugs in it, but it's not going to be a problem for the end user, so I don't care. So the problem currently is that uh, no protocol specified. Protocol specified. So we send the byte order, the protocol major version, the minor version. length of authorized protocol name, length of authorized protocol data, authorized protocol name, authorized protocol data. I don't think I'm doing that. So, okay, let's see here. Here, let's go to the structure.
Okay, so I have a U8 success, a U8 reason length. Uh, so one byte, one byte, two byte, two byte, two byte. Uh, and that's the request, right? Oh no, that was the reply. Uh, the request is one byte, one byte, two byte, two byte, two byte, two byte, two byte. It's the order padding, major, minor, auth proto, auth data, and then more padding. So we're sending byte order, one byte, one byte of padding, one byte of padding, two bytes protocol major, two bytes protocol minor. Uh, looks good. Then I have two bytes auth proto. Okay, that's this auth proto protocol name. But wait, that's authorization stuff. Do we need that? Apparently, we need that even if we're not doing authorization. That's kind of what I'm getting from this. So, this should be the length, though. This should be the length of the auth proto. This should be the length of the auth data. And then this is the, the two bytes padding at the end. And then there should be a string with the protocol name, padding, protocol data, and then more padding. So I'm saying I don't want to do authorization, but I do want to specify the protocol so that it'll connect. Oh, while, while I'm thinking of it. These debugs. I'm going to allow it to upcast those. And uh, the shorts. Sure. <laughs> Go ahead and upcast them. I think it should be fine. So I'm just going to do present you for everything. Now, let's read about this connection process. For TCP connections, uh, we're not on a TCP connection. We're not on a DECnet connection. I don't even know what that is, but it's definitely something ancient. Presumably some kind of early, you know, network protocol on like the, the DEC machines, DEC. So the good news is we successfully parse a, a connection failed. Bad news is that our connection fails. <laughs> hmm. Let's jump to the beginning of this document. Let's search uh, protocol.
Maybe not the smartest search term. Connection setup. I'll send an initial byte of data to identify the byte order. We're saying we're a little Indian. So yeah, we're sending these, but we're not sending these. And I think that's what it's complaining about, us not sending an authorization protocol name or protocol data. But it says if they're empty, this is to be interpreted as no explicit authorization, so I shouldn't need to set those. So why is it telling me no protocol specified? You know, one thing we never checked after we fixed our debug, our stuff we were fixing even before that, PLT alloc, uh, we never checked that this actually worked. Tell me. 11 IPC adder. Oh, that worked. Yeah, it's that's right. That's what we want. but we're getting no protocol specified. This isn't telling me the actual low-level things that are happening, though, which is what I care about. I'm not using some buggy program. I'm using my buggy program. <laughs>
think I'm probably going to have to take a look at what, uh, at what XCB does because I'm not getting good search results. See, like this is talking about Xhost stuff, like don't think I should have to do that, like normal programs work for me just fine. It must be something that XCB does internally, you give it permission. Anyway, I'm going to uh, take a quick break to have some lunch, uh, but it won't be long. And then we're going to dive into the XCB source code to try to figure out what it's doing that we're apparently failing to do. So I will uh, see you guys in a few minutes.
We are diving into the XTB source code to figure out what it's doing that we are failing to do. So I assume there's an XTB connect call. There is an XCB con dot C. Now let's take a look at that. So they're doing some fancier stuff than what we do currently. Which is one reason you might want to use XCB. Uh, it's a very good library. The problem, the reason I don't want to use it, 
is because for such a small program we're writing, it like it's not worth it. You have that much bloat in your executable. Uh, compared to doing it from scratch, like having the entire C standard library, even if it's like muscle, which is really small, comparatively speaking, to like glibc, you know, <clears throat> if you're linking with uh, libc and the uh, xcb, and if you're statically linking, you uh, have the problem that you can't properly connect over TCP because I think that it it told us about uh, there was a problem that uh, one of the things it uses for connecting to TCP like it's not available in the stat if you build it as a static library and like it needs to use a, a version of the library that it loads at runtime. Um, so I think really the proper thing to do is to dynamic link these libraries and then you're depending on the user having a sane system which I don't really want to do um, you know it's just uh, like we don't need dependencies like this so I'm happy to write to do, to you know do the work to write it from scratch. I think it'll result in a you know a good quality product long term. And it's just really fun. <laughs> you know that's part of it, just the joy of programming. So here we see they're setting this is the right setup, okay. So this is relevant to us. Um, so yeah, you see they're doing some IOVEC stuff. I don't know anything about that. I know it's Linux stuff. I have a Linux book, but I haven't looked into that stuff. We're just doing simple write and read. So they have an XCB setup request structure called out, and uh, they're zeroing it with memset. Um, they set the byte order to uh, either 0x42 or 0x6c. I'm just setting it to lowercase l, which is going to be the equivalent of uh, 0x6c uh, and then the x protocol and x protocol revision I'm setting to 11 and 0 so some things we can do is double check that these values all are matching up and take a look at their xeb setup request t structure but I'm pretty sure it's gonna match up now they also have authorization protocol name length which they set to zero they set the data length to zero so that's probably something we want to do is set those to zero because if we're not setting those to zero like our structure that we're sending over the socket is smaller than the structure they're sending over the socket we can say that much for sure so, uh, you know, it, I don't know what it's going to do for the, the stuff that we didn't send. Um, that might be why it's complaining, that the, the size of the structure doesn't math, match. So it says it, you know, it needed the protocol. It's the error. It just fell back on, I guess. I don't know. So that's the first thing I want to do, I guess, is compare structures. Um, 
And yeah, you can see the way they're doing it is they're using this. These, I assume the V is vector, IOVAC. Um, yeah, because like IOVAC, right, vector. But I don't, I don't know. These IOVAC things, and they have this part stuff. So it's like they're. And then they use this XEB out send the parts and the count. And of course, they, they, you know, synchronize that with a mutex. But uh, my understanding is that this is the way, the way they're doing things here is how things are done to make it asynchronous. Um, whereas our code is synchronous, it, it blocks, right? We just wait on a, on a write call and a read call, which is very simple by comparison, but has performance impl implications too, that we're just, you know, spinning, waiting for, for our reply. But regardless, the thing I want to know is what this structure looks like. What was it called? Setup request. Okay, so here's what they do. They do byte order, pad zero, protocol major, protocol minor, authorization protocol name length, authorization protocol data length, and then the, the final padding on the end. Interesting. So uh, let's just change up our structure oh so slightly. Or wait a minute, the the auth proto and the auth data. So we're doing the same thing, aren't we? We're actually doing the same thing. See, because we have auth proto and auth data after major and minor. That's the uh, protocol name length and the protocol data length, and then the two bytes of padding. So we have a matching structure. That's interesting. And we're setting these to zero, which looks good to me. So what doesn't it like? Let's go back to the XCB connection.c file. Hmm. 
they do have this padding. So see, they they have the structure, but then they also have three bytes of padding, and so they do an XCB pad the size of the the request. So the padded size of the request is the length of the thing. And then there is, so like the first part of it is the actual request, right? Uh, this is the pointer to the request. And then after that is a pointer to the padding. So these three three pad bytes here. I don't know if that matters. So they're doing some kind of some kind of trick here to uh to detect the endianness. We're not going to study that. We're just hard coding our endianness. We could try putting it as 0x6c explicitly instead of L, but I'm pretty sure it, it you know, it should be the same thing. I mean, you're just you man ASCII look at 6c in hex, lowercase l, right? So if you're casting this to, you know, an unsigned integer, it's going to be 6c is the value in hex. So, hmm, I guess my questions are, we do the protocol protocol revision, we can check if these match what I'm studying. And there's the padding, which I wonder about. Now we're, we're assuming no auth info, so we skip this entirely. And then we send that stuff. Now here's where we read the server response. And again, it's doing things a little bit more complicated. But I mean, uh, it looks fine to me, like what we're doing. I don't see anything jumping out at me that's saying like, you know, this sets the protocol or, you know, this um, sets permissions for us to be able to do it. Here we see the low level right vec stuff.
This is connect to file descriptor. And we see what it's doing. It sets file descriptor flags. It does a pthread mutex in it. It does xcb in in it, xcb out in it. It writes the setup. It reads the setup response. Uh, it does extension in it and xid in it, whatever those do. And if the result of all that uh, failed, I guess if any of this fails, because these are chained together with and, so we're saying if any of these steps fail, do a disconnect and uh, return the error code. Otherwise, we return the uh, the connection. So it could be that we need padding. It could be that our values are wrong for protocol major and minor. Uh, it could be that we're missing a step in some of the stuff we're doing up here. So they set file descriptor flags. They do a mutex in it. We don't care about mutex in it because we're not multi-threading. So I'm pretty feel pretty confident that we can skip that. Uh, XCB in in it and XCB out in it. Those maybe could be doing something we need to be doing. But this right here is set file descriptor flags. Uh, we're not 132. So it does FCNTL on flags. They set it to be non blocking. But I mean, this is just, you know. This is setting it up so that they can do asynchronous stuff. I don't think this matters. What's the CLO exec? So does this documentation
Okay, so... F get a fl F set of L F set of D So the CLO exec is saying that the file descriptor will be closed upon successful execution of exec. Uh, and again, that doesn't matter to us. I really don't think that matters to us. So the first thing I want to do is where did we see that? Uh, in right setup here, it uses X protocol and X protocol revision. Okay, well, they're defined to be 11 and 0, so those are correct. We have those correct. So we're narrowing it down. It could be the padding. It could be that we need padding. Or it could be one of those other functions that we saw it was doing in the the file descriptor connection thing it's not set of flags it's not pthread mutex in it so it's either xcb in in it or xcb out in it either that or there's some kind of um like environment variable that's getting set outside of this before you do the XDB connect to file descriptor. I want to take a look at the in in it and the out in it. Okay, so this is xcb in.c. Let's see what that's doing. So they have a whole thing for reading a packet. They have git event, free reply list, read block, blah, blah, blah for reply we are looking for the init 
could just search it, but you know, I kind of want to see what's in the file while I'm looking for it. it has like event pulling in it. Here we go. XCB in init. Uh, we don't care about the pthread stuff. It sets in reading equals zero, in queue length equals zero, in request read equals zero, in request completed equals zero, in replies equals XCB map new. If not, in replies return zero, current reply till, in current reply, event till, in events, pending replies till, pending replies. So uh, it doesn't look like it's this, uh, unless it, uh, like this is just setting up the XCB in structure. Uh, the only way it could be this is if XCB map new is doing something. Um, but that sounds unlikely to me. Let's just check if that's in this file. No, of course not. Um, I'm going to go on the assumption right now that it's not that, which might be wrong, but uh, we're going to try to find the most likely culprits. Uh, this is doing the same type of thing here, zeroing out the structure. Uh, it's not that, definitely not that one. Okay, so here's what we know. It could be something happens before we connect to the file descriptor. Um, it could be that it happens when we connect to the file descriptor, but in that case, uh, it would either have to be padding on the end of what we're sending, or it would have to be in the XEB map new call. So we're narrowing our scope down on, on what we think it is that's, that's doing whatever we're failing to do. So if I go back to the connection one, we see uh, all this stuff. Uh, let me double check read setup, but I'm pretty sure we saw it didn't do anything interesting. It's reading in blocks doing allocations, reading in blocks, and it just, you know, parses what it got from it, right? It's just reading and parsing, you know, and allocating memory to do that. So that's, you know, pretty straightforward. That's not doing anything special. Now, my question comes back to, Isn't there a XCB connect call that isn't connect to file descriptor? Because it could be that something is being set up higher up in the call chain. So let's read through this carefully. My PLT create window. XCB connect. Yes, there is an XCB connect. I don't think it's in this file though. No, it's not. It's not in this file. So 
So where is the actual XCP connect? I know we're over time. I should be doing risky business right now, but I kind of jumped in deep into XCB stuff and now I kind of want to, you know, see it through while it's fresh in my mind. Let's see here. Did I scroll too far up? Because I'm getting man page results. Did they put a man folder in the source directory? They did. Oh, why would you do that? Disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. Okay. Um. Can I tell Egg to not, not search the man folder, please? Ignore Dur. Or just ignore, I guess. That should give us some more manageable results. Well, it still scrolls off my history. Oh great, if we pass it in. We pass it in less, we can't even see the highlights. I think I can work with this now. Aha, uh -huh. xcbutil.c, 485. Okay. <clears throat> it calls xcb connect to display with auth, auth info, uh, and it passes null for the auth info 
which is what you'd expect. So uh, what does XCB Connect to Display with Auth Info do? Uh, it has a file descriptor, a display, host protocol. Our auth connection, okay, it parses out the display. Looks like it parses it into a number, an int. Uh, Then it does an XCB open call to get the file descriptor. Okay. If auth, it does connect to file descriptor with FD and auth. What about it if not auth? What do you do then? Uh, you just pass zero in. Unless we need to actually do the get auth info, but I'm assuming we don't need to do that. And you just, you know, we take this branch right here. What I'd expect. And that's that's it. Hmm. So if it's happening higher up. It could be uh, that we're actually doing authentication, in which case I would need to support it, but I don't think that's the case. Um, but that is now a possibility we have to consider, in which case um, not, the, not the kind where we request it, but the kind where you do get auth info. I don't know what that does, the get auth info. But it's possible that that actually would give us authentication info that we need to use to connect to it. Hmm. So the parsing of the display, I don't think that's going to do anything funny in it. And it looks like the open should be in this file too, so we can comb over some of that code too. Just jump to the top of the file. Okay, here's parse display. So it gets the environment variable display. Um, we're going to assume we don't have launch D. So right here it's parsing that stuff out. We do this in our code too. Maybe not quite the same way they do it, but we're doing this stuff too. Oh yeah, that, that looks fine to me. So that was underscore XCB parse display, I take it? Yeah, so I think we called the one without the underscore, but it's just a wrapper. Here's XCB open. Here's where they have the base 
for the socket for Unix, which is what we're doing. Uh, we're not supporting HP Unix. They apparently put it in user spool sockets. We're just doing the normal, the normal Unix style that Linux uses. So our display does not specify TCP, so we're not taking this code path. Apparently Solaris has their own place for it too. They put it in their TSOL doors. It's interesting, but this is just for Linux. I am not supporting Solaris or anything like that. It would be easy to add support if anyone, if any of you guys out there are, you know, Solaris users, you know, and you buy this software from me or get it from a friend, it, it would be easy to uh, to add support. I imagine. I'm trying to make, I'm trying to structure my program so that it'll it'll be easy for people to add backends if they so choose. But I'm only really supporting the backend that I'm going to be using myself, basically. So here they're concatenating it together. They have it parsed into a a number. They parse the display into a number. Uh, and what I did is I kept it as a string because why parse it from a string to a number if you're just going to convert it back to a string, <laughs> right? Like you can save some work there by by just keeping it as a string. Now, I don't know if we're actually going to need the value as a an integer later on. You know, if we do, then this would make more sense. In which case, I'll change the code to do that. But uh, no sense to do that ahead of time, right? So it looks like they delegate to uh, an XCB open abstract. Oh, this is if you have abstract sockets. Presumably, we're actually going to be doing XCB open Unix then, rather than abstract sockets. I think we're just going to go to XCB Unix because we're on a Unix system. And uh, we're not going to be doing any of this open TCP nonsense. So I think the next thing to look at is XCB open Unix. Open TCP. Open Unix. Okay. So they have a sock editor Unix just like we do. File descriptor. They set the uh, family to AF Unix, just like we do. And they're copying in the, the file name, the file path into the path, just like we do. That all looks good. They have a length. I don't know if we use a length, but whatever. Um, so they do an XCB socket call to actually open the socket. And then it looks like they're configuring it in some crazy way that I don't I don't know what this stuff is doing. But it looks like it's just configuring it for performance reasons.
right? It's just saying if this is less than some number, which happens to be two powers of two, 64 times 1024, then value equals 64 times 1024, and you're setting that in the socket options. So it's some kind of socket configuration. And then they do a connect to it. So that's what we do too. Um, so that seemed pretty straightforward to me. I don't feel like there was any funny business there. Um, I mean, it is possible that this is doing something that could, but no. <laughs> I mean, it's an, it's X11 is giving us the error that the protocol needs to be specified or whatever. That shouldn't be affected by setting some value in socket options, I don't think. So, yeah, looking at the XCB code, we know the whole chain of commands. We know that if you're writing XCB code, you like the first thing you do is you call XCB connect, right? And this is doing that whole process that we're currently working through writing. Like everything we're doing in the X11 backend right now is this, <laughs> this line of code. Because so we're trying to get this working pretty much. So, um, so when we do XCB connect, we know that what happens is under the hood, XCB connect goes to XCB uh, connect to display with auth info where auth is null. Um, we parse the display out and it wasn't doing anything weird there, it looked like. Looks like the same kind of thing we're doing. Uh, then it does an XCB open, uh, which we saw actually will go to XCB open the Unix one specifically which just opens a Unix socket, more or less. It changes some options in the socket option, whatever thing, depending on if the value is less than whatever. But that shouldn't be a problem for us, I don't think. I'm pretty sure that's just a performance thing. Um, then uh, we might get auth info. Like this might return something that causes us to do this code path. Otherwise, we would take this code path, which is what I'm expecting, and we saw in connect to file descriptor what it does. Uh, it does a chain of different things, but um, the only one that was relevant to us really was the connection one where it's doing it's writing the setup. The right setup is the thing that I'm a little curious about. The other one was the input one where there was an XCB map new call. That might be doing something too. But I mean, we've analyzed this code base pretty deeply now. We've really combed, combed through the entire setup process and nothing jumped out at us. So. I kind of want to do an XCB build of my program and then run it through a debugger and watch what happens in the XCB code. But that sounds like something to do tomorrow because like I say, we're already over time. Um, we're like 30 minutes, over 30 minutes over time for, for a risky business. So. It is a good time for us to uh, end this PCALC stream here. So to those of you watching on uh, YouTube, I'll see you guys in the next episode.